Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Know to Grow podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ivan Khan, and I'll be breaking down topics around education, growth, and culture with the intention to help your own growth journeys. For those not familiar with our hosting organization, Constitutorial, I serve as a CEO there, and we serve kids K-12 through and supplemental education centers throughout New York City. One of the unique privileges of my work is the opportunity to really know the various communities that our team serves and discover the various challenges that students face within themselves, their families, and overall community systems. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Mr. Jason Clark. Uh, we'll be speaking about something pretty serious today, uh, criminal justice reform. Jason and I actually go way back to high school, and currently Jason serves as the president of the MBBA, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Jason Clark was born and raised in Queens, New York, attended Bronx Science, then went on to undergrad at Princeton and University of Michigan Law School uh, before returning to New York City to uh, continue his work and uh, do some great community work. Jason, welcome, welcome to the podcast. How's it going, bro? Dr. Khan, it's a pleasure to uh, be here with you. <laughs> Fantastic to have you back in Queens. Um, let's just get to the today's topic. It's a serious one. So, you know, you and I uh, attended high school at Bronx Science in the mid to late 90s. And back then there were, um, it, was a, it was a couple of famous cases, infamous uh, cases that really brought uh, police brutality issues and uh, criminal justice reform to the forefront. Uh, the two cases that I, were always in the headlines were the Abner Louima case out in you know Brooklyn, uh, where um, there's some, some a brutal attack on an innocent individual, and uh, tragically, just short two years later, we had the tragic passing of Amadou Diallo. So, how did that? If you want to tell us a little bit about those two incidents and how that shaped uh, your uh, approach to education from a young age. Yeah, sure. So, uh, as you just mentioned, you know, we went to um, high school together. And uh, for those of you who just want to get a little bit of background, uh, we used to play basketball together. Uh, we used to be on the same bus from uh, Queens out to Bronx Science a few times. Yep. And, uh, you know, it was great because, you know, you really had an opportunity to, you know, get to know folks. And, uh, you know, when you're having that long trek uh, from, uh, from Queens to the Bronx, uh, you know, you get to know people pretty well and you get to know um, who has the best answers to uh, different uh, chemistry and <laughs> to have math questions. Finishing our homework. <laughs> exactly. But, Sharing um, our work. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I guess to uh, what you're saying, I mean, criminal uh, justice reform is, you know, such an important issue. And I'm just really excited and, you know, encouraged that it's been really on the forefront uh, for the last couple of years, but especially, I think, in this last you know, year or so. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to your point, I mean, you're talking about some of these cases that happened uh, years ago. I mean, we're talking now like 1999 yep. and it was two years before that, 97. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, for those of you who are uh, less than, um, you know, our age, you know, yeah. we're just starting to get up there. <laughs> Uh, essentially, I mean, the case that there are two cases, right? Abner Louima is an individual. Um, I remember it a little bit. It was really the, uh, the Amadou Diallo case that I think yeah. that played a role for me. But from what I remember about Louima, it was an individual who was arrested. And while he was being detained, uh, he was uh, sodomized by a number of, uh, police, of uh, officers police officers, I believe, with a, uh, with a broomstick. With a broomstick and a whole bunch of other uh tragic attacks. I mean, right. just really gruesome details of the case. Right. Um, and I know the case caught a lot of, um, uh, fortunately, there was, uh, you know, it was a rare instance of justice when the emergency department nurse at Coney Island informed the internal bureau that she feared that something had happened to him, that right. he was uh, brutally assaulted. And uh, that really opened up the eyes to the blue wall of silence, because even though uh, a former officer, Justin Volpe, is still doing time 30 years for that attack. He wouldn't, you know, you know, let out who the other individuals were. So mm -hmm. um, even the police weren't snitching on each other. And, uh, you know, uh, fortunately, that was one of the few cases where justice came uh, to light. Right. And, uh, you know, I just read that one of the officers, you know, is still getting promoted uh, from, from, the, from the Diallo case. So moving to the Diallo case. Tell us a little about that. And it happened in Soundview, the Bronx, in early 99, right when you know, we were finishing high school. Right, yeah, you see, uh, and I'll, I'll always 
remember that case because it's uh, a big part of actually why I decided to go to law school. Mm. And um, that's because uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, there's this individual, Amadou Diallo, who was uh, uh, an undocumented uh, kid about 23 years old. So mm -hmm. I remember I was a senior in high school around then. So it was just a couple years older than us. And there were three plainclothes police officers who came to him. Um, they thought he fit a description, um, you know, according to them, of a uh, of a suspect. And he goes up to them and they tell him to, uh, you know, to raise his hands. Um, but uh, Mr. Diallo, who um, didn't know English, he started reaching in his back pocket for his wallet. And these three plainclothes police officers. So again, they're, and I think the plainclothes is important because. It's not as if you see someone, you know, they're an officer because they're in their uniform, but you see three folks who are coming up to him, like slowly, you know, kind of shouting things at him. So he starts to reach for his uh, his wallet to show his um, his credentials that he's allowed to be able to. Uh, he was in front of his own house trying to just get inside after a meal. Yeah, and, I mean, right. And there was a witness account that uh, shared that the police had not identified themselves. So there was a little conflict there, whether they had even identified themselves in the first place, mm -hmm. causing to more confusion. Go ahead. Yeah. And then what these um, officers did is they shot at him not once, not twice, not three, not four, not 10, yeah. not 15, not <clears throat> 20, not 30, not 35. They shot at him 41 times. Killing him. Um, 41 times. Right. Yes, definitely uh, yep. killing. I think 23 of the shots um, landed yeah. on him. And uh, the short of it is, uh, you know, this ha happened in the Bronx, as you were mentioning. They, um, the officers were tried, but first the case was mm -hmm. um, relocated upstate, I believe, to Albany. To Albany. And uh, even though the individuals who did the shooting, the individuals who were shot, the actual um, incident all took place in the Bronx. It was uh, taken, it was uh, moved upstate. A jury in Albany determining uh, a case in the Bronx. That's right. In an area that historically has a um, more of a quote unquote, you know, law enforcement, Friendly. pro law, yeah, pro law enforcement kind of background mm -hmm. there. And sure enough, these uh, officers were acquitted of all charges. And, uh, you know, to me, this happened, you know, again, my senior year in high school. And, uh, you know, they started throwing away around all these terms as to why he was, uh, uh, why they were acquitted, such as he's turned such as qualified immunity and what have you. And, you know, I didn't know any of that stuff. You know, I was 17. But yeah. what I heard, it just, whatever it was, it just didn't sound like justice. Nope. And uh, I know at that time, you know, myself and a few other folks at, uh, at Bronx, I know you're graduated by this point, but a few yeah. of us put together a, a student demonstration. We walked out of the school. And, uh, you know, the short of it is, you know, we ended up ha being able to speak with a number of different local officials and, you know, some people took pictures. But to me, it seemed like, you know, it was more looking like a photo thing for folks. You know, people want to say, oh, look at these kids who are doing, you know, what have you. But there was no actual change that was happening. And to me, it always made me feel that, well, I mean, do you want to be someone who's just talking about some of these things that happen or just, you know, something you talk about at the dinner table or what have you? Or do you try to put yourself in a position to be able to do something about it? And so what you do? Well, um, let's see. I, I ended up going off to, uh, to college, uh, you know, working really hard. And then from there, I knew I wanted to go to, uh, to law school and to really start to develop my um, um, background in public interest law and figure out ways that you could be able to give back and help those in the community who likely don't have the same type of for any of the same type of education or under the same type of resources to be able to help themselves, but figure out a way to be able to come back and help people get the type of justice that uh, too often goes um, um, unnoticed. So uh, tell us, tell the listeners, where'd you go to college and what was that like while keeping um, criminal justice reform in the back of your mind? Yeah, so um, I went to uh, Princeton uh, you know, it's funny because I had spent my whole time thinking that, uh, you know, when I go to college, I'm going to go far away as possible, you know, go, you know, have some experience and then come back and live the rest of my life in New West York. Coast. So uh, I got on the New Jersey Transit, mm -hmm. <laughs> was able to come back and even get my hair cut uh, right across the street from St. John's, you know, every few weeks. So uh, wasn't as gone as uh, much as maybe I thought maybe I was a sophomore, but. Is that around the corner from the pizza shop? That one? Uh, yes. 
Yes, there we go. Yep. There we go. Right mm-hmm. over there. And, uh, you know, I had a great time uh, when I was at Princeton. Um, you know, I felt like, um, for me, it was certainly felt like it was a, a nurturing um, environment. One of the things I was actually always proud of at Princeton, it, didn't, it happened two years after me, so I didn't necessarily get the benefit of it, but they were the first, um, uh, one of the first colleges to state that they're going to, um, um, you know, make all of their, um, their, their financial aid based on need. And this is at a time when a lot of other, especially the Ivy League schools, some of them, I won't say their name, were saying, yeah. well, having to pay for college is part of the experience, you know, which is Outta funny here. because a lot of folks. Ain't you no know, one trying to pay for college like that, even yeah. though it's Ivy League education. Or if you have, if you're coming from a uh, background of wealth, you know, you're not paying for it. You know, your parents are, someone else yeah. is. So um, that's actually something I was always um, very proud of. Um, but I definitely think it was when I was at Michigan that I got my legs about you know, what I wanted to do. I took this uh, constitutional law class and it was around the time that, uh, you know, some of the affirmative action cases were uh, uh, being so litigated. Before we jump to Michigan, Michigan's where you went to law school, right? Mm-hmm. I got to touch a little bit about Princeton because, sure. you know, you're a young black man on campus at Princeton University. What was that like? And what advice do you have for men and women of color entering college? Uh, oftentimes the diversity is not there on campus. Right. Uh, what was that like for you? Uh, and what advice do you have for those after you for undergrad? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, in some ways, it may have been uh, a little unique. I, I had a great experience. Um, you know, you have things happen here or there. But for the most part, I felt like the people I knew who were really supportive. And, uh, you know, I felt like I had my friends who, uh, you know, came from similar backgrounds to me. And we all kind of you know, really huddled together, I think, in the beginning. But at the same time, uh, you know, when we go out, you know, I was uh, fortunate enough to be on the uh, on the track team. So, you know, from day one, there were about like 50, 50 other, 55 other people I'm spending three hours a day with. So I got to be able to make friends, you know, pretty uh, quickly. I did notice that there were some folks um, who um, who maybe were a little bit more shy about kind of branching out. And, uh you know, it, it's difficult for everyone. I mean, I, I think if there was actually... They stayed to themselves with their own groups? Inclusive? Yeah, some, some folks who had uh, stayed to their own groups, but then by the time it got to like junior or senior year, okay. it felt like, you know, they had strong bonds within this group, but then there are all these other folks that maybe they didn't have an opportunity to build that same type of bond with. Um, but if anything, the thing that really um, surprised me was uh, when I'd see all the private school kids, of course, <laughs> a lot of the... Um, you know, I'd go by, you know, I'd walk by, I may not know what your name was, but I'd say hello, I, you know, give a head nod or what have you. A lot of times people kind of give me this look like, I don't know who you I are. don't know you, man. Why yeah. You? So, 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 so that was, was a little so interesting. So yeah. when you ran into other kids of color, particularly from private schools and you gave them like the queen's head nod, like, Hey, what's <laughs> up? I, I recognize you. I respect like a sign of respect. Yeah, it just, just didn't translate. Like they didn't understand where you're coming from. Right, and I don't, you know, I certainly don't want to say that was all the folks, and that wasn't no, the no. large majority. Um, but it was something that you know, me and some of the other folks who came from similar backgrounds uh, definitely took notice of, and uh, you know, it was just kind of a disappointing. Like I know that my parents and my family was very, you know, I think proactive about making sure that you know, yes, I, you know, I come from a, um, you know, an African American background. I had that type of. Uh, you know, upbringing. I had friends who had the same um, experiences, uh, but in the schools I was in, it wasn't always that way. So I, I definitely felt like I came in with a little bit of an advantage. You know, just realizing that uh, you know everything. Uh, you know that that there's a lot of similarities, folks, and actually a lot of that came from Bronx science because. I remember when we were there, you know, you'd have the groups, you know, who would sit together, you know, yeah. during lunch, but at the same time. Um, it was, wasn't was hard to sit or get to know or, or speak with other folks. And I think probably the biggest thing I learned from Bronx Science is, you know, whether you're uh, South Asian, whether you're Black, whether you're Latino, whether, you're, uh, you know, you're Asian, or, you know, what have you. Um, there are a lot of people who work hard and there are a lot of people who don't. And it's not something that really depends on, uh, you know, what Your color skin you color, are. Yeah. yeah, but you start to see it. And it's one thing, I think, for people to tell you that things. But when you see those things yourself... You know, to me, that kind of changed and really, um, you know, gave me my experience because it's one again, it's one thing for people to tell, you know, uh, you know, these stereotypes are not out there. But I think the difficulty some people have or some people may say is that they think, well, you know, I see X people this way and, you know, I see them on TV or I, I saw, you know, this one person doing what have you. And, 
you know, they, you know, they think I'm not supposed to say this, but this is what I really <clears> think. But when you actually have experiences with folks, when you get to know people from different cultures and backgrounds, you start to see that, you know, yes, you know, maybe folks have certain traditions, um, you know, that make them, you know, feel like a, uh, a certain ethnicity. But when you're talking about some of the core things, so some of the values that people have, you know, they're, they're similar and whether or not someone is able to go well or work hard, you know, that all, a lot of that comes from yourself. And a lot of it, you know, comes from also, you know, uh, you know, what opportunities are available to you. Man, you grew a lot in, uh, <laughs> you grew a lot in high school, Jason. I mean, yeah, um, we both did. I mean, I guess to sum up some of the, the takeaways for the education portion, uh, folks, young kids got to keep an open mind. Um, and you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't trust how the media depicts uh, someone who looks differently than you, who may be sitting next to you on the school bus or the right. cafeteria. Um, so leading into a little bit uh, of the growth before we go into our first break, you're, you're in charge of Dream Chasers now. Um, you founded an organization around mentorship and academic success. Um, you know, why did you start it? And uh, we'll go into more of that in the next portion. Yeah, sure. So, uh, man, I mean, I think, you know, this is actually probably a perfect um, tie into what we were just talking about, because I remember uh, coming back to, uh, you know, my high school, they had this program called, uh, I think, Project Acceptance. Accepted, yeah. Right, yeah. Or Project Accepted, yeah. right. And you come back and, uh, you know, you get to see other students who are preparing for interviews for college. And, uh, you know, I just remember going back and realizing that there were just no black or Latinx folks who were there. And, you know, I had known that the numbers have been going, getting bad. But when I got there, uh, the only people I knew, except for maybe one or two <clears> folks <throat> in my, my may or one or two students, the only people of, of, who are black and Latino backgrounds were, you know, the people like me who were coming in to, um, to help folks. And, uh, the, you know, gra the graduates, the alum. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and that's <clears throat> what, you know, it, it really made me angry, honestly, um, because I know how how important being able to get a quality education, you know, played a role for me getting into a great college, getting going to law school and getting my, you know, fulfilling my dream of becoming an attorney. And the fact that other folks, you know, who may be coming from underperforming school districts, who may not have the same access to resources, may not be able to have those same type of opportunities, you know, it's it's wrong. And uh, you know, kind of similar to what we were talking about when you know, for me, when we were talking about uh, Amadou Diallo and the thought behind there is like, well, I mean, do you want to talk about things? Do you want to just, you know, tweet about it and share, you know, all things that are good and it's a good step. But what can you do to really be able to make a difference to, you know, to make these things um, better in the future? And that's what Dream Chasers in a nutshell is about. You know, we provide free tutoring and mentoring to kids from uh, low income and underrepresented backgrounds so they can get into specialized high schools. And I certainly would be remiss to uh, say that, you know, a lot of this is helpful is, is possible because Constitutorial um, provides the uh, tutoring at a uh, uh, ridiculously uh, subsidized rate. It's, well, it's a privilege uh, to get to partner with you. On that note, uh, we'll take our first break and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about growth and how that ties into the criminal justice reform movement and how that's evolved in the past 20 years now that we all have cell phone cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be right back to all right. listeners. Let's Thanks, Jason. And we're back to the Notre Grove podcast. We are talking criminal justice reform with the president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, Jason Clark Esquire. So, Jason, prior to the break, we were learning about Dream Chasers. Uh, it's a mentorship and academic enrichment program in Harlem. Um, and while Cons gets to do a lot of the tutoring portion, one of the things that I've really picked up on and I've grown from myself is the type of mentorship that you guys bring to the table uh, from your colleague Nick uh, to uh, Essence and to a lot of the other mentors out there. Tell sure. us a little bit about the mentorship portion um, and how you guys uh, approach it and how you're helping communities grow after you. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think it's important, as we were saying, you know, education is, uh, is important for kids, especially to be able to have opportunities, uh, more opportunities than maybe the uh, generation behind them. Um, but I think, and at least this is what I remember too, you know, from, from my days, you know, when I was a student is after a while, it could almost sound like, you know, yes, I know I got to study. Yes, this is going to be mm -hmm. important. You've heard this thing a million times. So then when you go to kids and say, hey, we want you to do even more than that, <laughs> uh, it can be difficult to get that full buy-in. I mean, certainly the parents mm -hmm. will seem like, you know, they'll put them in the seat. But I do think that, you know, to be able to really do well, there's got to be a part where the student themselves kind of takes ownership and thinks for themselves that, you know, I'm doing this, yes, because, you know, my parents uh, drove me or made sure I was here in this seat. <laughs> but I'm also doing this because I see how this is going to help me get to whatever it is I want to do. I've seen, I've seen a lot of growth in between the two cohorts. Uh, by year two, I see uh, the Dream Chasers program have kids coming from Coney Island to Harlem, from, yeah. from the Bronx, all over New York City right. uh, to get that mentorship and that academic support. So how how do you guys achieve so much growth in that student buy-in? I know there are a lot of parent listeners. I'm a parent myself. I got my six-year-old and my four-year-old, and it's really tough to get kids to buy in. How did you guys achieve that? Yeah, and, and I think that's where the mentoring really comes in because, you know, you have the classes again and, uh, you know, you're like, all right, I know that this will be helpful, but I think you need to be able to have some folks, you know, especially it, I think it helps when you have some people who are, or who are a little younger who maybe are, uh, you know, young professionals themselves and maybe in an area that they're interested in. I mean, we have some, we have one student this year who said that she wants to be a NASA scientist. Yeah. Now, obviously, you know, when you're in seventh grade, that may change or you may decide you want to do that, but that's actually not what's really important. The important thing is that you um, be able to see people who are doing things like you, who won. I mean, the whole, the main idea for the, uh, for that, for the mentoring, to me, I call it like, it's the flavor flavor effect. You know, we want everyone, every student to have their own hype man. Someone who goes out there who's not me, who's not the other people, you know, talking about the nuts and bolts, just saying like, you know, what's going on? Like, you know, you can do this. Like, you know, I've had all types of issues myself or challenges or what have you. Yeah. So that people don't think that the only ones who succeed are, are people who got, you know, straight A's or 100% never made a mistake. No, yep, yep. people need to know that, yes, you know, people have had challenges. People who come from, you know, people have tough things that they had to overcome. So that's not something different. So you can, even though you may be dealing with some of these things yourself, you know, if you work hard, if you put the time in, you know, this can help you be able to, you know, get into a specialized high school. And then by the last day, you know, hopefully none of the students are listening to right now. I said yeah. at the end last year, and I'll say, um, you know, at the end for this program, too. But uh, it's actually not even really about getting into a school. No, I, was, I mean, it I was is going to say it is so that you can be able to have all these opportunities. But really, the growth the growth exactly yeah, yeah. you know the skills you know the being able to balance all these things you know all of that that you're developing you know wherever it is you go to high school wherever it is you go to college i mean at every step of my career you know not everyone and i think you know you start to hear this a lot when you're talking to parents of students everyone thinks you have to like get into harvard you have to get into like the number one everything every step of my career people have come from different backgrounds and but what's made the people what what the similar thread I've seen yeah. is there are folks who work hard. There are folks who are willing to put the time in. And those are the things that we're actually developing. So, you know, yes, you know, we want to be able to get in because, you know, it's important that we have people of color, you know, black and Latino kids in schools. I mean, to me, it's frustrating the fact that six, eight percent of all um, our New York, kids yeah. in New York public schools are black and Latino, but less than 11 percent are in specialized high schools and then when you look at a school like Stuyvesant or you look at um, like Bronx Science they have seven and 21 um, respectively you know mm -hmm. kids who are accepted into them you know again seven kids mm -hmm. at Stuyvesant 21 at Bronx Science and that's to me is wrong so there's things that have to be done to change that but more mm -hmm. important actually at the crux of it is making sure people yes you know they they, they learn the stuff to be able to you know increase their academic skills, but also that there are people there that they know are behind them. And what I'm actually hoping is at some point, as the program keeps continuing, 
that you know we could be able to help the kids with being able to get internships for things they're interested in. And That's then right. as we get to right. that junior senior year, be able to you, help them with their you guys have folks have from uh, financial institutions, healthcare, education, public service. You have so many uh, fantastic mentors in the um, rolodex uh, of of mentors. Mm -hmm. A revolving door of mentors at Dream Chasers. I gotta ask, who, name a couple of your mentors. Who was your flavor flavor growing up for you? Jason? Oh man, me, my flavor flavor. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, definitely, my, man, yeah. definitely my definitely uh, my my parents. Uh, yeah. I think that my mom was the vocal uh, hype man, and my dad uh, did so uh, through his, uh, um, you know, through the way he actually went went about his business, uh, which had a, a very indelible effect on me. Uh, I think that by the time, especially by the time I got to college, there are some folks like uh, Kermit Brooks who um, who ended up being the acting superintendent of um, for the state of New York of uh, oh. insurance. But I met him uh, when I was interning at the New York State Attorney General's office. And uh, even though I was a freshman in college, didn't know a lick really about law. Uh, law. Yeah. Couldn't really help with the litigation that was going on just that, but you know, can help in other ways. Uh, he took me under his wing and he helped me get to where I was. Uh, and then another one I would certainly be remiss to not mention would be uh, Carl McCall. Okay. Uh, Carl McCall was, um, he was a former state controller and wow. uh, he actually ran for governor against uh, George Pataki. Um, but I ended up meeting him at Bronx Science when he came back for the Famous Speakers Forum. Oh, wow. And, um, you Were know, you a he fellow was, famous speaker with him? Oh, no, no. I, I don't even think I was in the actual program. In the you know? <laughs> I was just active in student government at the time. Oh, this is, oh I, I thought this was an alumni story. So this is when no, you were a kid. Okay, no, this okay. is when I was uh, oh, wow. a senior at Bronx Science. And I actually at my desk right now, I still have this uh, picture of myself and... Uh, Carl McCall, who just uh, who just uh, retired this year and most recently was the uh, uh, the chairman of SUNY for the state of New York. So he's been going on doing a lot anything of special things. special that they did for you that that they that they uh, caught the first two shout outs from you besides your folks? <sighs> anything anything in their uh, ingredients that was a secret sauce? Well, I think one of it, I mean, Kermit in particular, like I remember um you know, feeling so bad. I think like oh, my my uh, my first year at Princeton because I think I uh, had missed like a bill on a payment, and I think I was sixty days late. And I thought, all in all, like my credit it was gone, and I would never be able to get any more loans, and I wouldn't be able to continue all these other things. And I just remember him just laughing, you know, <laughs> just being like, you know, it's not a big deal, but I'm glad you're learning this now. You know, a lot of people do these type of things, and you know, I think it was like a a bill of like a, like 110 bucks you know that's, something that's a lot when you're when exactly. you're a teenager so like when oh you're thinking no that, i was like how am i going bill, to get this the mca and then other people MCA are saying gets you after three months exactly so that and i just know for um uh you know chairman mccall he's just been always willing you know to speak with me you know through these years i mean i think the last time i i spoke with mr mccall was about like two months ago and you know just taking an interest in my development and, uh, you know, you need those type of things. And that's, again, kind of bring this full circle yeah. is why we kind of <clears throat> want to start plant those seeds in. And the great thing about it, I mean, we do to the best uh, of our ability, try to match folks with things that they say they're interested in. So, yes, it's good for the students. So they see that, you know, it's not just studying to study, but maybe it'll help me, you know, become a basketball player. Or maybe become, you know, whatever it is they want to do. I mean, you know, kids at that age, you know, they want to do all types of things. Um, but on the other side, I think for the mentors too, it's an opportunity to develop a really strong bond because they see someone just like them. You know, again, they could decide they want to do something else, but we had someone um, who was interested in business and uh, we matched them with someone who's in business. And now they see someone they're like, well, you guys are the matching of the mentors and the kids based on their interests and their profiles yes, and their, and their, exactly. and their backgrounds. You guys have a uh, fundraiser coming up and a dinner. Uh, please feel free to plug it here. So, because the main reason is I want to connect any of our listeners that may be uh, potential mentors mm -hmm. to become more involved and find out more about the organization. So, when's the fundraiser? Where can they find out more before we go on to some of the next uh, questions? Yeah, sure. All you got to do is uh, you could either go to dreamchasersnyc.com. Uh, you could also just put in Google the way Google works now. I don't even know how. Just put in dreamchasers and fundraiser and eventbrite and it'll pop up. 
Um, but it'll be over at uh, Morgan Stanley. One of our sponsors, this organization, 1844, oh, is um, uh, giving us the space so we can do this. And the idea is if we could be able to, you know, raise enough money, we could be able to expand and continue the, you know, the work. Shout out to 1844. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the things I am proud of in our first class, we had 10 students. So we're, you know, getting started small, but like a good class. And uh, of those kids, I know that. Uh, one of those seven um, African American students who got into Stuyvesant, again, of a class of 895 mm-hmm. kids, came from our program. Another student went on to was accepted into Bronx Science. Another was into Brooklyn Latin. And I know two uh, other of our of our ten students were accepted into other highly, uh, very highly competitive, non specialized high schools. Fantastic. And uh, this year we're just looking so to So Thursday, do more. September 12th. It's Thursday, September Eventbrite, 12th. Eventbrite, Dream Chasers, NYC. Fundraiser, and uh, Dream Chasers NYC. Check it out. So, a lot of time has passed since we graduated high school, Jason. Now, everyone got cell phones. We got cameras. We had the gosh darn NFL uh, brought into police brutality uh, thanks to Colin Kaepernick and his uh, courageous protests. Um, and it's also led to the technology aspect of it. And body cams has really revealed and unveiled, uh, pulled the, you know, pull the, the layers off of what's really happening out there. Uh, in New York, we had um, five years ago, we had the death of Eric Garner, uh, five to six years ago, who was, yeah. who was a father. I think it was five years ago, five, like last month. Last month. Last and month. it was five years ago, and uh, he was selling loose cigarettes, allegedly. And uh, in the police encounter, there was an illegal chokehold used by an officer, Daniel something. Pantaleo. Pantaleo. Uh, and it took five years for the officer to get fired, even though it was on the attack was on the the killing was on camera. Uh, we got a long way to go. So, what's next? What can people do to become more actively engaged as concerned citizens? Yeah, you know, you know, when we're starting to hear again about Eric Garner, we're hearing about Mike Brown, we're hearing about Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice. Rice. I mean, it's just amazing to me how these things can come full cycle, um, full circle, because, you know, we started the show talking about, you know, Abner Louima and Amadou Diallo mm-hmm. and issues of uh, police brutality. And then to see these things, you know, coming up again. And, and the ironic thing is that it's, it's not as if, you know, things had, you know, just all of a sudden just stopped and then we're getting a flurry of it now. But to like to your point. Uh, the fact that now everyone has police ca- or police cameras, people have cameras on their phones, <clears throat> you know, people can see things that are happening. And I think a lot of times people would make these allegations or, or would or would actually state what happened to them. But a lot of folks would say, I don't know if that's true or there may be some claim that, you know, they were resisting arrest. And, you know, people would be like, I don't know. Like, Not you know, from this half is the a... videos I saw. Right. But, kids but that, getting shot in the back, running away. But that's but that's just it. Now that people can actually see the video now. You know, people are saying like, whoa, you know, that didn't seem like resistance. That doesn't seem like excessive force. And I think what it is, too, a lot of folks who may not have these type of experiences growing up, they're thinking to themselves like, I've had experiences. I've said a whole lot worse to my officer. (laughs) Or I, I had a friend who did something a lot worse and they called our parents and were told to go home. They didn't have this same type of, um, you know, evolution or de-evolution of events that have led to someone losing their life or mm-hmm. people, you know, these, you know, tragic uses of force of trying to dominate someone as opposed to being able to detain somebody. And what can it, we do then? Well, that's just it. I mean, I think the first thing is certainly the first thing is always about awareness. And I think okay. that, you know, between, um, you know, you know, social media nowadays and just people being more engaged, you know, I think we're at that point. But I think the next step is trying to figure out, like, what things should we be holding our um, our elected officials accountable for? You know, I think it's great. And we've made a lot of changes when it comes to criminal justice reform, I think, within this last year, especially when it comes to bail reform. When we're talking about speedy trials. When we're talking about discovery reforms, all things that Fantastic will help to new reduce. set of lawmakers in New York State who are really pushing for improvements to that. I yes. Gotta, I got to give a shout out to some of the some of the folks who really uh, champion this uh, on the state side. Go mm-hmm. ahead, Dan. Yeah. And uh, so we're making the right direction, moving in the right direction. And I think the first part, which we are doing, is trying to reduce the number of nonviolent, you know, yeah, nonviolent, right, encounters that, you know, people are having and kind of get them out out of jail. 
Uh, mm. and, and especially when we're talking about barrel farming, I, I don't want this show to go too long. I'm start going down a, a rabbit hole. But one of the things that's always been amazing to me is that there are statistics that reflect that 90% of people who are in jail end up uh, pleading guilty. 40% who are not pretrial detainees end up um, pleading guilty. That's a uh, huge, huge chasm. So when we talk about why bail reform is so uh, important, it's because when people are incarcerated, when people are waiting to have their day in court, oh which can be 30, 60, or what have you days. Uh, you, you just know, give up and you're just you like, just, just... Yeah, you don't have... Your, you aren't able to be there for your yeah. kids. You know, you're, you may be... Let's say you have some type of uh, mental health regimen that you yeah. can't get to. You can't get to your job. You can't, can't you know, work. You can't exactly. do anything. can't do anything. All these things compel you to make a decision to actually be able to just plead guilty regardless of the merits get it of the over with. case. And, and even if even if there was no merits to the case, mm -hmm. I just want to get this over with. I'm just going to plead guilty because I need to get back out there. Right, oh right. But uh, to even kind of come back to where you're coming, and this is also goes into my hat, I guess, with the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Yeah, well, the MBBA is the largest association mm -hmm. of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. And uh, what we've been trying to do is a lot of work that has to do with trying to identify some of these inequities and figure out solutions as to how we can make the criminal justice system as well as some of these other systems fair. And when we're talking about issues of, uh, uh, you know, lethal encounters with uh, police officers and unarmed civilians, you know, making sure that I think some of the things when you're asking what people should be doing mm -hmm. and we're talking about holding our, our leaders accountable, we should make sure that people have a clear definition of what excessive use of force is. Oh. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, now that there are supposed to be body cameras and dash cams on police cars, that let's say uh, someone wants to bring a civil lawsuit because they feel like they're, um, they were the victim of uh, excessive use of force. If that, that dash cam isn't on, for whatever reason, there should be a presumption of so liability. higher awareness by the public will hopefully lead to higher accountability by those in charge, right? Uh, behind the badge, and that may lead to improved community relations through less violent encounters between police and the community, exactly. Exactly. And then, just uh, very quickly, some of the things we're trying to do with the MBBA, uh, this year, one of the things I'm very proud of is we're uh, launching a judiciary training academy. Uh, we're putting attorneys, uh, thank you, you know, who've been practicing for a while, but making sure that they have the skills to uh, become city, state, and federal judges uh, when those openings are available. We're going to be um, announcing a network of legal clinics on issues such as, uh, you know, for housing issues when it comes to some criminal issues, when it comes to, you know, wills and estate, all types of things that pe that could help folks. And just generally, I mean, if we're if we're if someone's listening to this and they're saying what should what they should do is one, they should identify again what things that they should hold their elected uh, officials accountable to. But two, just figure out what organizations are doing this type of work. I know with the MBBA, you don't just have to be a lawyer to be a part of it. You know, we need help for every. It's all volunteer so organization. MBBA. Yes. M triple B. Yes. M a. Yeah, MBBA. Double B. MBB. <laughs> so Metropolitan Black Double Bar B. Association. Yeah. So MBBA. Uh, and our website is uh, mbbanyc.org. Um, but whether it's our organization, whether it's another organization, there are a lot of community groups that are doing these type of works, and you can get involved. And especially, we ain't even going. This we'll have to come back and do another four or five shows. Yeah, we got a lot of about, uh, we got a lot of episodes coming up for uh, MBBA uh, initiatives to just kind of bring some spotlight to it. So we'll definitely be able to cover more. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah definitely. Um, but you know, when we're talking about what we're seeing with uh, undocumented individuals, yeah. and we're talking about you know ICE and courthouses, you know all these fees and warrants. I mean, Ugh. there are so many different areas that we could be able to do more about, and especially the great thing about social media. I mean, there could be some uh, uh, challenges as well, but the great thing about it is there is information out there. If you can kind of sift through and figure out what are the things that aren't just saying, "Hey, you know, this is mad, or this is wrong," or you know, kind of trolling folks, but thinking. These are the things that are going to make a difference in the future and then making sure that steps are being taken to make sure those things happen. Don't be a troll. <laughs> be a responsible social media user. There we go. We're going to make that our next hashtag. Don't be a troll and do some good out there. Right. Stop wasting your time. Yeah. Um, so before we go to our next break, you know, we'll be talking a little about culture. You grew up in Queens. Yes, sir. Um, who are your favorite uh, New York hip-hop artists before we go to the next break? 
Oh, Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas. Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas. <laughs> Any particular order? Is that in that order? No, nah, well, I always like saying that because they're, one of my favorite songs is uh, Marcy by uh, Jay-Z. Yeah. And I remember him saying, like, who are the best Jay- um, Big MCs, Jay Nas. Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas. Um, but definitely those guys. I love Lost Boys. I think I'm the only person who's... Uh, uh, I was actually at a Lost Boys concert, <laughs> well, at least with Mr. Cheeks, uh, we're gonna, early in the year. So on that, we're going to come back to us in our crazy world. Um <laughs> After this break. We are back to the Notre Girl podcast. We are joined by the president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, Jason Clark. And we are reaching our final segment of culture. Jason, mm. you and I go way back. Uh, some of our earliest memories are on the basketball courts, uh, beating uh, some of our older brothers and cousins, which is awesome. <laughs> Clapping on people, yes. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> that I, remember I, had the, I had the corner elbow jump shot, and <laughs> you, you, you had the handles. So, uh, music-wise, you know, we went to high school in the mid to late 90s. Uh, Biggie Smalls, Tupac, they got, you know, they were killed during our time in high school. Sure. Uh, you had the Jay uh, the Biggie uh, double album, and none of us could afford it, so we had to, like, <laughs> be really nice to you so you could let us, you know, borrow it on the disc man. Uh, take us to your the favorite, man, right? uh, you know, music, musical influences, being a kid from Jamaica, Queens. And uh, how has that evolved over time? And then maybe we'll get some uh, go into your wedding a little bit too, which was uh, I had a chance to attend. It was really fun. So sure. start with your music interest, Jason. Oh man, I've always been a Nas guy. Like I could listen to Nas. I've listened to it was written in particular probably about I don't know. I, I don't even want to say thirty eight. That was probably just in one summer. You know, like I remember we'd go out when we would be uh, you know doing chores or what have you. And you just keep listening to the whole thing over and over again. And uh, what's the most underrated song? And it was written. Um, it was written as the Nas's second album. Black it wasn't. It wasn't his greatest, but it was his, his second uh, maybe, greatest. Maybe. I was maybe. I guess um, that's up to a debate. That's up to a debate. So which one was Black Girl Lost? Black Girl Lost. Yeah. In fact, I think that probably be my favorite song. Kind of goes between that and Silent Murder and One Mike. But I think Black Girl Lost for the longest has been my uh, my favorite. Yeah, I know the message was mm. uh, big. It was a it was a crowd pleaser. Right. On it was written. But I got to give the Take It in Blood. That was my okay. uh, I think it was track six. That was definitely there. So Nas uh, being a Queens guy, uh, Biggie and Jay Z is, is that your top three? Oh uh, yeah. I mean I don't know. I always try and think of like what your what your top five is. So yeah, I, go for I, your top five. Let's do the top five. That's that's the usual conversation. Man, uh, I pro- what I would probably say for me, and you could definitely tell, you know, just like you're a kid of the '90s. Yeah, I'd yeah. probably say Nas, Biggie, yeah. Jay Z, yeah. um, Pun, and Ghostface. Big Pun and Ghostface. Yep. Yep, the that Cuban links. Oh my <laughs> exactly. Gosh. Exactly. Ghost and, and Big Pun. Uh, what did that do for you? I mean, we grew up in a culture of hip hop, probably, you know, you one of the, your top one five. of the, oh, my, top my top five. Oh, snap. All right. All right. Uh, artists or albums? Artists. Artists. All right. It, and again, it's, it, these are my personal faves. Mm-hmm. I got to go with Nas. Mm-hmm. Got to go with Big. Uh, I got to go with Snoop. Snoop's a personal fave. Okay. Um, I got to go for the whole Wu Tang, not a particular. I'm going to take the easy way out of that. <laughs> the right. whole Wu Tang. Uh, and did I put Jay up there yet or not? Nah, right. No, I don't think I didn't so. Put, I didn't put Jay. I mean, I like Jay's body of work and, and what he's done, but you know his some of his recent uh, moves uh, mm-hmm. with the NFL has has moved him down my list a little bit. <laughs> All right. But as far as new folks, I gotta I gotta throw a new person in there, and I'm a big fan of Kendrick in the new days, in the new era of of hip hop artists. So he may not be all time top five, but Snoop, Nas, Big, and Wu Tang, you gotta, gotta include them. They're they're always on it. And right. number fifth is you know uh, whatever my mood says. Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. So this was, you know, '90s era hip hop stuff that you and I grew up on. However, I had a chance to attend your wedding, and it was a 1920s Harlem Renaissance theme. It took yeah. place in Harlem, right next to the place where I attended college. I lived in Harlem for five years uh, before uh, it, it it changed. Uh, so 
tell us about that conversation with your wife and how you guys decided on that decision and the planning that went into the Harlem Renaissance themed wedding for you uh, a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very kind to say how we, we came to our uh, decision. Of course, uh, it was definitely uh, all her decision. And, you know, she had the, the foresight. You know, I wouldn't have even been uh, uh, thinking about it. And I think it kind of made our uh, definitely made our wedding unique. Uh, but I think the, you know, when we were discussing it and first, she had brought it up for the first time. I mean, I think part of it is that, you know, we feel like th- this is a time of like change. Yeah. Um, that people are looking for things. I mean, I think it started with Obama when people start to see, you know, like what is possible. Um, and I think especially with this current administration, people are also seeing like, you know, what needs to be done. And we're starting to think, you know, especially when you're looking at marginalized communities, underrepresented, you know, underrepresented communities and the ways that we could be able to make things change. You know, it's very similar to you know what we were seeing back then. You know, you had, uh, you know, the Langston Hughes and the Zora, oh, you know, Neil yeah. Hurston's and, uh, you know, the James Baldwin's, you know, just talking about, I think, especially from the black perspective. But, you know, at that time, people just looked at, you know, black folks as, you know, these, you know, country bumpkin folks, you know, in the South or what have you. Mm. But I think a big part about the uh, the Harlem Renaissance is that people were saying, like, no, you know, there's a lot of sophistication here. There's a lot of, um, of the, you know, the artwork. When you look at what how people were, you know, living their lives and how people were taking a stance really for the first time in a long time, really coming into their own and being able to say that, you know, some of the things that have happened in the past that we're not going to let happen anymore, you know, it it brought this huge revolution that, you know, span outside of Harlem to New York, to the East Coast, to like the rest of the country. Wow. And I feel like we're getting there. Like we want to do that same type of thing here. And I know especially like with me and I, like I'm very into these, uh, you know, these issues of social justice. I feel like she's into it even more than me. <clears throat> and when we're trying to think of like, you know, what I think, you know, encapsulates, I think what really brings our love together and then what encapsulates what we would like to see with all of our best friends and all of our family members and what all of us are looking to achieve, you know, there it, there was a nice, um, um, you know, there's a nice feeling of being able to go back, you know, to the ancestors, you know, the ones who, who did it first, who, who did, who had to deal with so much that we could be able to do more. And, uh, and, and also the, the fashion was uh, pretty awesome. So, you know, we're able to, uh, was incredible. yeah, everybody was came incredible. dressed up. You never know Upper when you say that if people will do that. Ties. People did, man. <laughs> it was, it was incredible. My wife and I, Nipa, we had such an amazing time. And, um, Obviously, it was very historic. Even as a Bangladeshi uh, New Yorker, um, a lot of our uh, ancestors ourselves uh, first emigrated. Uh, sure. They were ship jumpers and they settled in Harlem because mm. they could blend in. And uh, they weren't allowed to marry uh, white and that's people. that's where things were here. affordable at the time, too. I know. Have. I mean, and it, and it was, you know, you couldn't interact uh, or, or marry a white person. So a lot of Bengali men... Um, lived in Harlem and married uh, black and Hispanic women uh, just because the, the laws didn't a- allow mixing. And, yeah. and so we have we have some uh, some uh, some of that uh, roots in uh, Harlem. And even fast forward this many years uh, for my wife and I was incredibly uh, empowering to just be in that room uh, for your special day. Oh, and then and the music playlist. From the Donnell Jones, <laughs> that was the, the one thing the, I had. To the one twelve <laughs> to the uh, Raphael Sadiq, you guys had all the late nineties Carl Thomas, early nine, late nineties, early two thousands R and B playlist. That was amazing, amazing, uh, fun. So that's and, actually a quick, uh, not, not to interrupt you, a quick no. um, side story, and perfectly why she's the one who used to be in charge of what you know was in charge of the wedding. But she was like, "I right, want to do this Harlem Renaissance." I said, "I want to do a woo wedding," you know. <laughs> <laughs> a woo wedding. At least that's. What, I mean, I was, we could have joking. both. But I was like, exactly. Put all the music. She was like, all right, we're not even gonna let all the music be there, but we'll make sure that there's a little set. So there was one set where it was just all Wu Tang. Oh, Tang set. Yeah, for about like 25 minutes. Oh, uh, so that was my little carrier. But that's exactly why. 
<laughs> she was the one who was in charge of that. I loved it. I loved it. I can't wait to uh, find out more. Uh, you guys have been married for a year now or two years? How long has it been? Yeah, we're getting to a year. So it was October 27th. So we're getting there. Oh, we're congrats there. on the first Thank anniversary you. coming yeah. up for Trying you. Trying to be like you guys. <laughs> um, I mean, I appreciate it. appreciate it. We just celebrate our 10th. and um, Congratulations. It's, it's, uh, it's been... Uh, it's been a blessed journey. We've uh, been blessed with two kids and uh, you know a lot of great memories. And I can't wait to see what you guys have in store. Uh, before we wrap up, you too. <laughs> um, you are a huge Marvel Comics universe dude, and I don't know if it's like the one year we're you know we're different in age, but you've come back home to Jamaica, Queens. Uh, you're moving back this weekend. Right. Uh, I'm happy to have you back in, uh, in the borough. Thank you know, you, you know, I'm right down the road. Uh, why Marvel Comics, and um, what final messages do you have uh, for the future superheroes listening at home? <laughs> this is one, yeah, we're going through all of the um, um, all the pieces. We'll so, go through it. We're gonna we're not gonna leave any stone unturned. You know, I know for me, um, I actually gotten started in it because I was started. You know, my parents actually have started busing me to a different school because the actual uh, my zone school. The way my mom actually uh, told the story <laughs> is that. Um, uh, they would just have me do um, errands all day just because they had to get some of the other kids um, up to. Right? And my parents. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And my parents, you know, had invested in a lot of pre-K and what have you for me. So, you know, that was at least the, the reason there. But I remember uh, when I was going to this new school and getting started where all the other kids, I guess, seemed to know each other as a part of this uh, this uh, MAGA program that they were having. You know, everybody was into uh, these like cards, you know, these Marvel cards. And, you know, I wanted to be that. I wanted, you know, as a new kid, I was trying to. Yeah, um, you got to fit in. And, uh, and I just ended up getting into it. And for whatever reason, you know, some of that stuff actually just uh, uh, stuck. And, you know, now to be able to see all these movies that came out, like, you know, they just had Endgame that just came out a couple months ago. And uh, 23 Marvel movies that came out. Damn, and um, like 10 came years, to that threshold. 12 years. Yeah, over an 11 year, uh, eleven year period, I was like, man, I mean, what, what a time! <laughs> what a time to, to be, be alive. alive and to be able to see those things that you know, you look at these cards on the back and see like what their superpowers, and they have these little bars that say endurance or yeah. special abilities. Yeah, I had the Stanley card, the Ghost Rider yeah. rookie card, kid, Marvel right. One deck. <laughs> yeah, so who's your favorite just... Marvel superhero? Oh, it goes back and forth to me. I actually, I have a one A and one B. For me, it's oh, uh, it's a uh, Panther and it's uh, Captain America. Panther so, and Captain America. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but it's it's good to see that it's out should, there. And you should get the shield the and and, and <laughs> put a new spin to the color colors of the spin. You know, I was on the F train and I just remember being on the train and I started looking at this guy and then obviously it started to look weird because you're like, why are you just you know looking at some random person? Yeah. And I just remember looking at him and just because he had this backpack, but it was like a backpack in the shape of a shield. And I just remember giving him a head on being like, yo, man. Where'd you that's get a, it? That's a, that's a Send me the place. link. Send me the Amazon you know? link. And all of a sudden, like, we connected. It, it, it went from weird to, like, a bombs right there, like, in a split On second. the subway. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of that in Queens on the exactly. train exactly. under the lays. <laughs> Jason, uh, it's been such a pleasure speaking about this pretty heavy topic. I mean, we've known each other for 20 years, uh, at least, 25 years nearly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and criminal justice reform in big cities, uh, it's not only happening in big cities, it's happening everywhere. Uh, we're so uh, grateful and blessed to have had you speak on this really critical topic. Uh, this topic isn't going away anytime soon. So uh, we're going to anoint you our, our, you know, our, our expert in criminal justice <laughs> reform. And we can't wait to have you back and share a little bit more about what's happening with MBBA, the Dream Chasers um, fundraisers coming up. Uh, you know, you've, you've really reminded young folks to keep their hard work ethic up and i know that a lot of your work with dream chasers uh is bringing that to life a a lot of um what you grew up on and the culture that you had in your home around uh strong academics and and support and exploring you know your best and your favorite favorite stuff so on that note uh any particular shout outs where can we find you on twitter uh, IG, where can we follow uh, your amazing wife yeah, um, on Twitter? Like, give us the shout outs and we'll uh, wrap up this show. <laughs> Sir. So, uh, you can find me at uh, Jason Miles Clark. Uh, that's for, for Twitter as well as for Instagram. Uh, I know my wife, who has her own uh, podcast called Schooled. Uh, she's at, uh, I think, Nia Ham TV. That's Schooled. one of hers. Check yes. out the Schooled posca- podcast. Right, exactly. And uh, Nia Ham? Nia Ham, exactly. And uh, yeah, if there's one last thing I would uh, just leave it for guys, uh, it's just that, you know, all of us, like when we're talking about 
you know, our leaders in the back, when you're talking about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, I mean, they were younger when they passed away, when they when they were assassinated than we are right now. So when we're thinking sure. about all these areas, when it's criminal justice, when it's affordable housing, whether it's education, you know, it's up to all of us to be able to do something. Now, I try to use this uh, hashtag, you know, I'm a solution. And that's because each one of us is our own solution to these areas. So all of us can be able to do this um, work in our areas or with other folks. But, you know, it's really up to us to be able to, uh, you know, do some of these inequities and make us a better world for others. Incredible. Thank you so much, Jason. No problem. To all of our listeners, uh, tune in next time and always remember to pay it forward. Thank you for joining us today. Catch you next time. Go to grow. Go to grow. Go to grow. <laughs>